Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I love to hear that sound. It's the ringing sound this morning. Thank y'all for the prayers this week. I thank y'all for all the prayers. Continue to keep my family in prayer. And also some friends of mine uh, that are going through some tough situations like that.
you've been set free? Amen. Sin is not our master. Sin has no condemnation uh, for us. If we have been set free, the Lord Jesus has paid it all. Amen? Amen. Thank the Lord for that. What a great song that is. My chains are gone. Good to see you here today. We welcome you to church. And it looks like familiar faces to me. And i um, glad to have you here. You might have noticed my wife's not here. And she's a little under the weather. Uh, so uh, I don't think it was the weather that caused it. But anyway, we would use that phrase. And I uh, uh, hope she will be able to come back in and feel comfortable this afternoon. Um, the big announcement is that tomorrow afternoon is our trunk retreat where we try to have a great reach out and uh, contact not only the children that would be looking for treats, but also their parents that may be coming and supervising. And I challenge you and myself to be there and uh, help out any way we can. If you're available and maybe you haven't been able to announce that yet to Lorraine, but you now know that you will be available, you want to get out and enjoy some of this liquid rain that's going to be coming tomorrow, off and on lady, then be sure to tell Lorraine and uh, let her know that she can count on you and uh, come bring your trunk in your car or uh, truck and uh, or the bed and uh, bring your candy and we'll have a good time passing out treats to uh, the kids. Just maybe we'll be able to witness and invite others that come along with them. So let's be praying about that and have a good time coming together tomorrow afternoon. Starts at 5? Yeah. No? We're going to be here at 5.30. 5.30. Starts at 6. Starts at 6. Okay, so we'll be here at 5. 5.30. And it uh, starts at 6. Okay. Um, so I think that'll cover up for our announcements. Brother Carl's going to come and read our scripture today. So I encourage you to go ahead and look in your Bibles to Mark chapter 1. And uh, we'll be reading the scriptures here. Zoe, church, 
that we could reach many more, especially even tomorrow, and that you would have your will lay in this service. Lord, give us ears to hear, give us uh, eyes to see, and hearts to receive all that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Right. You all will stand and turn to hymn number 772. 772, singing the first, third, and fourth verses of when we all get to heaven.
Amen. Thank you for the singing. And uh, if you are willing to read scripture for us in church, if you'd let me know, please, I would put your name up here somewhere, maybe even write it down, possibly. And I'd love to have you do that. But just if you're willing, just, just say I'm willing. And uh, I'll take that to mean that you're willing to read scripture and you're willing to say, no, wait a minute, I'm willing to think of the time, right? Uh, so the reading of scripture, but then also praying, uh, sometimes it would help me to know um, who, who to uh, not call on and call on on purpose. So just let me know if you feel free. If you don't, I'll ask you sometime. All right. But thank you for uh, reading today, Carl. And uh, you know when when you're when you're in a truck with the preacher for a total of five hours. <coughs> That preacher can take advantage of you, can't he? Can't he? Yeah. <laughs> There's no place to run between here and Glenwood, Georgia. Uh, when you get out there in that South Carolina countryside. <laughs> but we had a good time together, and I appreciate that. We will be looking at uh, Mark chapter 1, sort of working our way through Mark, also on Sunday night. So. If you miss Sunday night, then you might be missing, well, you will be missing part of the coverage that we have going through this book. I encourage you to be here this evening and um, participate. We'll be studying scriptures together. So last week we talked about lots of things that Jesus was doing. And today, uh, as you noticed in the reading, we're going to be looking at the fact that friends got together with Jesus. He became their friend and friends got together. Peter and Andrew were brothers. Evidently, they lived in the same house still, even though Peter was married. I don't know exactly how old they were at this time. But they had friends named James and John who also were brothers. And they were friends as uh, living in the same area of Capernaum up around the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus became their friend. So they, they, there were friends in this passage, also a family. Peter invited Jesus. Of course, I guess Jesus could have invited himself. If so, that was perfectly all right, don't you know? Uh, but they went to Peter's house with James and John, and there were others there, Peter's wife and Peter's mother-in-law. So we'll look at family a little bit today. But the mother-in-law had a fever, so we're going to look at fever and talk about that a little bit. And then um, Jesus cast out some demons, and he was fearless. He didn't have fear, and I think he was teaching the disciples, don't fear uh, fake gods. Uh, just uh, trust me, and I will never leave you nor forsake you. And so then uh, all this falls under the category, I believe, uh, where Jesus told these men, follow me. So we're to follow Jesus. We're going to look at some of those uh, ideas. I don't generally use those alliterations of the, uh, F, 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 those things, but uh, we'll be using that today all right, as we go through this passage. And so Jesus uh, starts preaching and he preaches in the synagogue, Capernaum, and uh, there was a man there with an unclean spirit or a demon and he cast him out. In verse 28 of Mark chapter 1, verse 28 says, And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around about Galilee. So folks are hearing about this man, Jesus. Was he really the Messiah, the promised God-man, although they didn't really understand how God was going to come and be with them as Emmanuel, God with us, uh, but they were asking the question, could this man really be the one sent from God as he claims to be? And many, many were following, many were believing. They were interested. John the Baptist had done a good job, hadn't he? He had preached in the whole area, particularly around Jerusalem and Judea, but preached that the promised Messiah was coming. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, because the kingdom is here. It's coming. So many people were interested in Jesus. So now look at verse 29. 
Now as soon as they had come out of the synagogue in Capernaum, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew. Well, you notice right there, don't you, that Simon refers to Peter. In fact, Jesus changed his name and said, Thou art Simon, now you will be called Peter. So when we say Peter, which is generally, generally the way we refer to this disciple, we're also referring to a disciple whose name was also Simon. There was another disciple that was named Simon, and he was not given a different name. So we're talking about Simon Peter. They entered the house of Simon Peter and Andrew's brother with two other followers of Jesus, James and John. So I want us to look just for a moment here. You have James and John, brothers, friends with Peter and Andrew. And now they have another friend traveling along with them. They would certainly say he was their friend, and that was Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus the Christ from Galilee. And yet they would not just say he was their friend, would they? They would also say he was our Lord because he is sent from God. He is the one God promised. He's the one we've been looking for all our lives. Good Jews who knew the Scriptures and knew God had promised a Redeemer, a Savior, a King of the world that would ransom the Jews and set them free, not only from sin, but also from other bondage. The thing is, they were expecting all of that to happen very soon even though they were under Roman rule. And Jesus did not destroy the Roman government, did He, when He came this time. But that will happen in later days. In fact, the Roman Empire did fall, but not to Jesus necessarily. Uh, and so we have friends here. And these were friends that initially, it was based on their occupation. Peter and Andrew were fishermen. James and John were fishermen. James and John's father, Zebedee, was a fisherman. And so they were friends, co-workers. Maybe they didn't pull their money together in one business, but they did help each other. They knew each other. And they had friends uh, in their common business. They were also now co-believers in Jesus Christ, this man Jesus. And they were following Him. Jesus had said to them, Follow me, Peter. Follow me, Andrew. And then He spoke to James and to John and told each one of them, Follow me. And they were following Jesus. So they were friends with Jesus in that they were fellow or co-believers. They were believers and friends in Christ and for Christ. And for him. So, friends are so important to us. I just want to ask you who are your friends? Sometimes, as we get older, we have wonderful friends that we've spent lots and lots of time with in the past. Maybe it was on the job, maybe it was in a neighborhood. You know, isn't it wonderful to meet people and they say, Well, we spent the weekend or we spent several days on the holidays with some old friends that used to be our neighbors live next door to us and we love them dearly and it's been 20 years since we lived next door to them but they're still our wonderful friends. Isn't that great to hear that? Whatever the friendship may have begun with, spend time with friends. So who are your friends? Who listens to you when you talk? Who pays attention? Who cares? You know, who listens to you? Who are your friends? Who are our friends? Or better than that, who do you listen to? Who's your friend? Right? And they have your ear. When they want to say, talk to you, you're willing to drop what you're doing and listen. Who do you listen to? You know, it does matter, doesn't it? And as believers in Christ today, we have many friends. We even have friends of the unsaved. But there's a special friendship with other believers, isn't there? And maybe those who are unsaved that are our friends, that we do spend some time with, maybe they will yet come to trust Christ themselves and be saved. That's your prayer, isn't it? That's our prayer. That's our desire. So, on Wednesday nights here, we've been studying lately the prayers that Paul prayed for the churches that he had been a part of. 
And we'll be doing that again this Wednesday night. And we've been studying Paul's prayers. Paul prayed two prayers, or he relayed to, in the letter to the Ephesians, he relayed two different prayers that he gave, gave regularly for those believers. And one is in Ephesians chapter 1, around verse 17, and another was in Ephesians chapter 3. Paul said, I pray for you this way, and he told us what that prayer was. And we just concluded that if Paul prayed for other believers, and he prayed using these ideas that you find in Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 3, then that's a great way for us to pray as well. And so we're talking about that, studying that, challenging each other to pray this prayer. And I want you to know that I've been trying my best to pray. I won't say my best. I've been trying to pray for you according to these prayers. Ephesians 1, 17-19. Ephesians 3, I forget the verse. But then also Philippians chapter 1, the church of Philippi. God, God gives a prayer. Paul gives a prayer that he prayed in Philippians 1 and then also in Colossians. He told the people in the area of Colossae and the churches there that he prayed for them in a certain way. All the prayers are similar, but it's a way to pray for your friends. It's a great way to pray for your friends. Who are your friends? I challenge you. I encourage you. Pray for your friends and pray for them like Paul prayed for them. We pray for them when they're sick. We pray for them when they're going on a long journey. We pray for them when they lose their job or their children lose their job. We pray for them when they're sick and when they get cancer. We pray for them for all these things when they lose a loved one. Let's let that, please, let's not let that be the only way we pray for our friends. Paul teaches us how to pray for our friends. And it's in those prayers. There's other ways we can learn how to pray as well. But these are the best ways I know scripturally to pray for yourself, for your family, but especially for your friends. So I encourage you, be a friend. Ask God to give you more friends. Ask God to give you a friend. Ask God to give you friends. Ask God to help you be a friend. Be a friend for the sake of Jesus. And then one more thing I'll say about friends. Tell them thank you. You know, it's pretty amazing if you think about it. Okay? I'm saying this about myself, okay? It's pretty amazing when you think about it that somebody would be a friend to me. Or you. you need to thank them. Because there's something about and some things about all of us that would disqualify us from being treated as a friend. Huh? True? <laughs> so the friends you have, tell them thank you and mean it. And then don't lose a friend when they might disappoint you as well. So we have friends here. Jesus was a wonderful friend. Don't you know they enjoyed being with Jesus? Then also, in verse 30, they came to the house, but Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever. And anon, and that's an uh, early English word, um, they told him of her. So quickly, one of the first things they did is said, hey, my mother-in-law is here and she's sick with a fever. Well, <clears throat> Jesus uh, is introduced to the family here. Maybe he didn't immediately right then go to see the mother. But it didn't take it long. But we have the idea of the family here. Peter lived, and I think that his brother Andrew lived there as well. It said into the house of Simon and Andrew. He lived there, and he had a wife. There's a, a wonderful Christian uh, TV series out uh, where it, the wife's name is Eden. And I don't know if that's in the scriptures or not. But The Chosen, if you haven't seen a wonderful Christian version of the life of Jesus, check out The Chosen. I highly recommend it to you. And um, so Jesus quickly learns who that is. And he's introduced to the family. So I don't want to run out past this idea that this family was in this house, Jesus was invited, and other friends were invited to come in and spend time with the family. 
I just think that's a beautiful thing. It's not limited to Christians either. It's a beautiful thing to get to know not only your friend, but your friend's family. When you get a chance to meet people's family, honor them. Show them honor. We are to show honor, preferring one another ahead of ourselves. Right? And so that's what was going on here. So Jesus went with Peter to the family. And they welcomed Jesus. One of the saddest things I see these days is families who don't get along. That may have uh, its existence somewhere in your family or my family as well. Families that don't get along and don't appreciate each other, in fact, do not want to get along and get together and be together. Now, if you're facing that, let me just tell you, do not give up on God changing the situation. You, you may have given up on you changing the situation. That's probably a good thing. But do not give up on God changing the situation. And do not give up on God using you to help change the situation for the better. Family problems can really be heartaches. So it may be your fault. It may be their fault. It may be my fault. But let's do what we can do to honor the family. Ask God to use us. You know, we want God to use us, don't we? Let's ask Him to use us in that brother that hates me, if that is the case. Or on that, or that cousin, or, or God forbid, the parent, the mom, the dad. If people don't get along. Maybe it's anger, maybe it's hate. Whatever it may be, God can change it. And if you'll ask your Christian friends and your Christian church members here at this church to pray for you, we will. We will. And we won't do it in a judgmental way. Okay? Because we all have our faults. We all have our struggles. But maybe we just will see more of God working miracles in our own lives and healing our families. And may you be a minister of that. There's a great book written by Paul David Tripp called Instruments in the Hands of the Redeemer. That's what we are. Instruments in His hands. But most of us have family members who love us and they accept our love for them. And family is a wonderful time, wonderful thing to enjoy. And uh, of course, you know, we're coming right up close to Thanksgiving and then Christmas. What a wonderful family time that is. But every time ought to be a good family time. We have family that love us and we love them. We have family that lets us talk to them about Jesus and they talk to us about Jesus. And that's one of the most beautiful things that can exist in a family. I hope that you do talk about Jesus in your family and when you're with your family. You can't talk about Jesus too much. Now, I do know somebody might tell you that you do and they may say, you always talk about Jesus. Would you quit talking about well, you need to ask the Lord for wisdom and grace to handle that properly. But you really can't talk about Jesus too much. You can't honor Him too much. You can't love Him too much. We need to talk about Jesus. Even when it seems so awkward in our families to do so. You know, I, I think one reason it's difficult to talk to family members about Jesus whenever the, that situation exists I think it's because we've gone so long without making it a habit that it seems awkward now to bring up Jesus. But I encourage you to do it. And ask God to show you how. It's amazing what God will show you to do, how He'll show you to do things. If you just ask Him to. And I love to hear your story of how God helped you do that as well. So just try. And God's pleased to help you. To do that very thing. And if you will pray the prayers of Paul from Ephesians 1, 17 through 19, that'll change your family. That'll change you. And if you want, want us to help you pray that, just say, Preacher, Brother Richard, Sister Linda, or whoever, just say, would you pray for my family like that prayer you're talking about in Ephesians? Yeah. I'd love to do that. Wouldn't you love to do that for somebody else if they asked you to? 
Amen. So let's let's be that kind of loving friends and care for one another's families. Um, I love my family. You know who my most important family is? You. Is you. Even Jesus, when Jesus resurrected from the from the dead, it was written that in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Even Christ, once he was raised up, we know him no more in the flesh, but we know him in the spirit. And so we're to treat fellow Christians not only on a fleshly basis, but on a spiritual basis. So we know Jesus now on a spiritual basis. We don't have Jesus tapping us on the shoulder, rubbing elbows like he did when he was with his disciples. But we have him in a spiritual way, which is a more deeper way, which is a deeper way. And so, not belittling your blood-born family, but your blood-bought family is the most important family you have. And I praise God for my Christian family. I praise God. So now also in verse 30, we read that the mother-in-law lay sick of fever. Uh, we all know about this, don't we? About sickness, about cancers, about diabetes, about uh, what all kinds of sicknesses. Uh, even dementia, all kinds of sicknesses. And here was a family that had this sickness and Jesus came in and immediately healed her. Let's, let's see in verse 31. So he took he came in and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she served him. So even though there's sickness around us, we can trust Jesus. Now Jesus knows what he's going to do with your sickness. And how long he's going to be using your sickness. And God may use a sickness you have your whole life. You know what? If God does that, is that okay with you? If it is, he's working all things together for good. Even allowing that. But he also told us that we could pray for you. And we rejoice Wednesday night to find out that Miss Bobby's, all of her cancer has decreased. Right? So we praise the Lord. And um, so we need to pray for one another, of course, because Jesus can still heal. About a week ago, Karen and I got word from a dear lady who sat right behind us in the Peter Church down in Georgia, and she's dealing with cancer, and she came back uh, with the report. In fact, called Karen and, uh, and told her that all of her cancer had decreased. Now, Miss Bobby, hers is free of cancer, right? Is that right? Totally free, yeah. I was getting two stories mixed up, okay? With our friend Mary Ann, I mean, all of her cancer has decreased. God gives healing. God helps us, and we need to trust God for healing. But we need to trust God during the sickness as well, and during the pain. Now, let's read verse 32 through 34. These are our last verses for today. So here they are at the home here. And at evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. They knew him, but they knew him only in a certain way that was not a saving knowledge of him. And we'll talk about that sometime. They knew him. They knew he was the Son of God, but they did not know him. In knowing him intimately, trusting him. And those of us who know him, trust him intimately. But here we see that Jesus is fearless when facing the enemy. Here, the demon-possessed came, and the sick, and all of those, and Jesus had no fear, of course. And he taught his disciples, and he teaches us today, 
And we don't need to fear anything that comes from a fake God. Fake gods are fake news. <laughs> you know? We don't need to fear. Uh, we just need to trust God and live for God. Know the truth about the devil, that he's a defeated enemy, and he'll lie to you about everything. But Jesus did not fear him and commanded that they would come out of those, and they did. So don't bow down. Don't, don't be, live in fear. In fact, look back at verse 25 that we used last week. And here was one that was a demon. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Shut up. Like Carl. Hold thy peace. That's what we tell the devil. Hold thy peace and come out of here. Be quiet and come out. Jesus was furious because he had all authority. And we have authority in the name of Jesus. We don't need to fear the fake powers that are around us. Those things that try to interrupt us. We just need to study what's right, what's positive, what's true. The true God. So don't focus on the evil as far as the powers and what can, what can happen. But focus on God. And that's what we have right here. You know, God has a great purpose. God is up to demonstrate and showing something. He's demonstrating and He's showing who He is. And He is Jesus. God is Jesus. Jesus is God. And He's showing us that He's a God of holiness and God of truth. At the same time, He's a God of mercy and grace and power and authority. And He's a God of purpose and a plan and a provision and promises. And He will take care of you. No matter what. Focus on God. Be fearless. Place your hope in Him. Now remember also that Peter had already said to these four disciples, follow me. And we need to follow God about our friends, about our family, about sicknesses, fevers, uh, about other things that would be fearful. We just need to follow Jesus. And we can follow Him. Um, Jesus demonstrated that he was 100% man. If he was not any God, he was totally man, but he was not. He was 100% God. If he'd never become man, he's 100% God. He was 100% God and man, and we can trust him. That's who he is. And he demonstrates from God the Father, he demonstrates to us love, mercy, and grace. Now, in reading from Mark, we read that the disciple here, the writer, is telling us who Jesus is. I want us to look also at another account of who Jesus is. Brother Richard, if you'd come, please. And this comes from John, chapter 1. John tells us who this Jesus is. John, chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was light, and the light was with the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear, witness of the light, and all that man through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man which cometh unto the world. He was the world, world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believeth him on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, but of the will of man, but God. And 
the Word was made flesh, dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, and the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The witness of John and the Baptist of the Son of God. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me preferred before me, for he was before me. And his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he had declared him. Amen. Thank you, Brother Richard. So we see another account of who Jesus is, who he was, who he is, the true Son of God, the Word of God. But as many as received him, to them, he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe on his name. Aren't you glad to know Jesus? Amen. Aren't you glad to have received Him and that He received you? Not of my works of righteousness that we have done. Not turning over a good leaf or a new leaf. Not working harder, but just believing and saying, Lord, just as I am, I come to you. And he come, we come to Him and He comes to us with healing, with strength, and guidance. And He has something for you and for me to do. Every day, be in faith. I trust that God is speaking to you, encouraging you, and that your hope is stronger than it has been, and that all of us are going to grow in that hope of the knowledge of God. Join with me in prayer, please. Dear Lord, I just thank you that you have given us your word, which is the truth, this reality. Blessed be your name. Lord, we've been set free by your amazing grace. I pray that you would help us as we respond, that our response to be surrender and dedication to you with boldness and wisdom and humility at the same time to serve you every day, even in the most difficult place we have, whether that is at home, whether that's in the neighborhood, at work, where it is, we will trust you. And I don't know. In the name of Jesus. Amen. If you stand together, the altar is open. You respond as God would lead you to respond.
Do remember and pray for Sister Linda this week. The surgery she's coming facing, and that it will be a great, wonderful success. And give her some relief with that pain she's dealing with as well. Um, hope you'll be here tonight and uh, be together as we uh, together look at more of the book of Mark and see what God has in store for us. All right, let's bow for a dismissal prayer. Dear Lord, thank you that you are our God. Have thine own way with us. We love you, Lord. We praise you. Thank you for everyone who's here. Bless those who wanted to but couldn't. And Lord, give healing in your precious grace. Uh, in the name of Jesus, for Linda, thank you for what